Hi friends, welcome to Usti Taking in Cardiovascular System. I am Dr. K. Haynes Raja, doing my DM Residency Cardiology from Christian Medical College Bello. So in this module, I would like to tell about the proforma, basic history taking proforma, what are the history which are important in cardiovascular system and what are the differential diagnosis which you can consider by asking those history. Basically, whenever you ask certain questions to your patient, you should know what is the clinical significance in asking that point. Okay, for example, the duration of dyspnea can tell you these are the probable diagnosis. The onset of dyspnea can tell you these are the probable diagnosis. The onset of chest pain can tell you these are the probable diagnosis. So, basically with history, from each point you ask the patient, each answer you get from the patient, you can understand that the probable etiology or probable differential diagnosis are these. Okay, so that is the most important thing and during the our last presentation we have seen lot of case scenarios which would have highlighted the importance of history taking with history only we can identify and come to a you know probable conclusion or probable differential diagnosis or probable diagnosis sometimes okay so ischemic heart disease the diagnosis can be arrived by this simple history taking and examination so that is the importance of history taking and here i would like to highlight the proforma what are the points which are very very important to be asked in your proforma and the clinical relevance as well Okay, so as usual, name, age, sex, occupation and address. These are the five points which should be asked first. Name for the identification, age for age-wise incidence of diseases and male or female. Yes, some diseases are common in males, some diseases are common in females. Yes, for example, your Raynaud's is common in females. Raynaud's, this is the Raynaud's picture. Okay, there will be vasospasm that will lead to paler pale FP, face of pale and there will be decreased flow to the you know distal arterial blood that will lead to pale face then there will be venodilation producing cyanosis then there will be reperfusion which will lead to redness okay these are the three phases of your Raynaud's okay and there that is more common in females but there is condition or erythromelalgia which are more common in males okay and occupation related disorders yes this Raynaud's can occur in persons who are using vibrating tools or typewriting more or piano players, okay, those people can develop this Raynaud's as well. Okay, whereas primary, basically Raynaud's can occur as a primary etiology and secondary. And the most common etiology for Raynaud's will be your systemic sclerosis, okay, scleroderma, where in 80 to 90 percent of the patients, Raynaud's will be the presenting symptom. Okay, based on the address, you can think of certain illness as well. Okay, and the presenting complaints, the golden rule is it should be always be presented in chronological order. For example, a patient having cough for 15 days, fever for one month. Okay, and dyspnea for two months. You should present like dyspnea for the past two months duration. Okay, and fever for past one month duration and cough for two weeks duration. So this is how the order should be. Okay, from the longest, the one month, the two months, then one month, then two weeks. Okay, it should be always in a chronological order. That is the golden point to be remembered. Okay, so coming to the history of presenting illness, what are the cardinal symptoms we discussed already? We discussed, what are the cardinal symptoms? Yes. So, number one, chest pain. Number two, dyspnea. Number three, palpitation. Number four, syncope. Number five, edema. So, these are the cardinal symptoms which should be asked in any patient in cardiovascular system. Right? So, the first symptom, chest pain. So what are the characteristic things which you should be discussing under chest pain? It is the mnemonic Socrates. Okay, so site, onset, character, radiation, okay, exacerbating, uh, associated features, timing, exacerbating or relieving factors and severity. Okay, S for site, O for onset, C for character, R for radiation, A for associated features, T for timing, E for exacerbating or relieving factors and S for severity. Okay, so based on this, what are the conclusions we can come? So, this is a very important table. So, the differential diagnosis can be considered for chest pain include angina, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, pericarditis and esophageal pain. So, anginal pain, the site will be retrosternal. Even myocardial infarction, both, are, both share, you know, a lot of points but thing is, this myocardial infarction can occur suddenly and it will be continuing irrespective of whether you take rest or you are continuing to move. Okay, so that is a very most important differential diagnosis for an angina. MI will be a, an angina 
and the severity is very very severe there will be severe pain okay so apart from that retrosternal or back pain can also be there in aortic dissection in a pericarditis pain is usually be left sided okay so sides retrosternal in angina and myocardial infarction retrosternal or back pain in aortic dissection left sided pain in pericarditis and even esophageal pain esophagus in the mediastinum so it can also cause a retrosternal pain so onset is usually sudden onset sudden very sudden onset in two conditions one is a myocardial infarction and aortic dissection suddenly the aorta gets torn okay in myocardial infarction suddenly the plaque ruptures and causes a clot and that will lead to pain but as angina it will be usually on you know, exertion so it takes some time for the onset okay pericarditis pain usually will be gradual and esophageal pain is usually gradual sometimes spasm esophageal spasm can produce sudden pain onset okay so character is constricting and heavy both uh, angina and myocardial infarction causes constricting or heavy type of pain for a steering or ripping and migrating pain can be seen in aortic dissection as the tearing goes further down the my pain also will start from the chest and will go down further okay as the tearing continues okay so that is the aortic dissection pain tearing ripping or migrating pain and stabbing sharp stabbing pain is seen in pericarditis and burning pain can be seen in esophageal pain okay and radiation can be due to can be to arm neck jaw or epigastrium in both angina and myocardial infarction okay and back or shoulder in aortic dissection trapezius ridge or left shoulder trapezius ridge is a classical point which can be discussed for a pericarditic pain and esophageal can also be a pain and also be radiating to back associated features dyspnea in angina sweating dyspnea vomiting and anger anemia as discussed already it is the fear of impending death which can occur in a patient with myocardial infarction okay and uh, focal neurological deficit can occur in aortic dissection sweating and syncope can occur basically when the aorta gets torn the supply for example celiac um, celiac artery is there superior mesial artery is there if the tearing you know impairs the blood supply then that sub then organ can get ischemia okay similarly the blood supply your supply vein artery can can be damaged okay that can lead to organ ischemia your um, blood flow to the brain can get impaired especially in ascending aorta dissection what happens is the blood flow to your brain can get impaired that can lead to syncope sometimes permanent neurological deficit okay and in pericarditis there will be always a flu like syndrome previously in the previous two weeks or can occur concurrently as well so fever or flu like syndrome can be there heart burn will be associated with esophageal pain okay so timing of the pain is angina it is 2 to 10 minutes okay it will occur in 1 to 2 minutes starts to occur in 1 to 2 minutes it lasts for around 2 to 10 minutes and as soon as the patient takes rest the pain will be relieved okay whereas myocardial infarction will be continuing and aortic dissection will be continuing this pericarditis is variable and esophageal pain predominantly in night time okay and what are the exacerbating factors or relieving factors emotion exertion cold okay these are the typical triggers for angina emotion exertion and cold or stress and exercise can precipitate a myocardial infarction okay there are relieving factors for angina rest or nitrates whereas there is no relieving factor unless you recanalize the vessel reperfuse the vessel you put a stent or thrombolyze the patient the pain will not be relieved okay and uh, aortic dissection that the uh, be spontaneously can occur and exercise or exertion can also lead to aortic dissection pericarditis the pericardial pain typical exacerbating factors are inspiration deep inspiration or coughing okay while the patient's pain will increase and sitting up and leaning forwards the pain will decrease okay tell me what is the abdominal pathology which can gets decrease with the sitting and leaning forwards it is your pancreatitis okay the chest chest organ problem which can get relieved or decreased by leaning forwards is your pericarditis whereas your abdomen pathology is your pancreatitis which gets relieved by sitting and leaning forwards okay and lying flat triggers in an esophageal pain whereas nitrates can sometimes relieve a pain of esophageal pain okay and severity will be mild in almost all the disorders except for your myocardial infarction aortic dissection where there can be severe pain so based on these sacrates okay site onset character radiation okay associated features timing exacerbating or relieving factors and severity you can come to a conclusion whether the pain is an anginal pain or myocardial infarction aortic dissection or a pericarditis or an esophageal pain so what are the common causes of angina angina can be due to 
two important causes. One is a coronary artery disease, where the blood flow to the heart is getting impaired. And next important cause is an aortic stenosis. Okay, so coronary artery disease or aortic stenosis. Okay, and sometimes can also occur in HOCM, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So for the myocardial infarction to occur, plaque rupture. Okay, plaque plaque rupture is an important etiology for your myocardial infarction. Okay, and the pericarditis can be due to post viral or uh, my post myocardial infarction. The patient can develop pericarditis. Okay, esophageal pain this can be due to GERD, gastroesophageal reflex disease. Sometimes due to hiatus hernia. Sometimes due to esophageal spasm. So these are the common etiologies which can produce this type of pain. Okay, and there are certain important questions which the examiner allow to ask you. Uh, what is angina equivalent? So what is angina? We discussed that when a patient is walking, he develops chest pain associated with dyspnea. It starts at around 1 to 2 minutes to interval and then it lasts for around 2 to 10 minutes and it is settling on its own or sometimes with nitrate. So this is called angina. So angina equivalent, the patient will not have chest pain. The patient will have only dyspnea. Sometimes the patient will have only sweating. Okay. So these are the symptoms. Sometimes the patient will have only vomiting. So these are the symptoms which occurs in, in, instead of chest pain, these are the symptoms which will manifest, which indicates that the patient is having angina. Okay, these are called angina equivalents, and these are common in diabetic patients. Okay, diabetic patients may not have a chest pain, but manifest with these other problems. These are the symptoms, but it, it, it is equal to an angina. Okay, so what is Prince metal angina? Prince metal angina. Prince metal angina is due to coronary vasospasm. Remember, it is due to coronary vaso spasm okay it is not an acute coronary syndrome it is different entity prince metal angina it's also called as variant angina okay nocturnal angina uh, can occur in um, basically angina only at night this can be due to sometimes uh, the waning of the nitrates effects okay we usually give nitrates at 8 am and 4 pm because to be patient should not develop a nitrate tolerance sometimes what happens is the effect um, weans off at the night time that can produce an nocturnal angina. A patient with uh, syphilis can also have a nocturnal angina, osteal involvement, coronary osteal involvement can also have nocturnal angina. Unstable angina is one of the component of acute coronary syndromes. There are three components of acute coronary syndromes as discussed already. One is a STEMI, another is an NSTEMI, and another is an unstable angina. Okay, these are very important conditions. You should be treating aggressively these three conditions. Okay, so now coming to the differential diagnosis, what are the causes of central chest pain? So central chest pain can be due to, again classify and answer, cardiovascular causes, esophageal causes, tracheal causes, mediastinal causes. Cardiovascular, esophageal, tracheal and mediastinal. So cardiovascular causes can be due to myocardial infarction, aortic dissection and pulmonary thromboembolism. Especially massive pulmonary thromboembolism can cause central chest pain. Okay. Whereas peripheral chest pain can, non-central chest pain can be due to pulmonary embolism. Small pulmonary embolism can lead to pulmonary infarction. Okay, one area of the segment of the lung can get infarcted and that can produce pain. That is also, be, uh, that can also be contributed by pulmonary thromboembolism. So esophageal causes of uh, central chest pain will be rupture and GERD. Tracheal causes tracheitis, inflammation. Mediastinal causes lung cancer, mediastinitis and thymoma. Okay, so these are the causes of central chest pain. Okay, non-central chest pain can be due to plural chest wall. So plural causes include infection, malignancy, pneumothorax, pulmonary infarction. Okay, pulmonary infarction I told a small emboli which can lodge in the periphery of the lungs and can lead to pulmonary infarction. Pneumothorax is air in the pleural cavity which can occur spontaneously in smokers sometimes due to trauma. Malignancy especially mesothelium and metastasis can cause a non-central chest pain. And infection especially pneumonia and TB can also cause a pleurisy which can produce a typical pleuritic chest pain. On deep inspiration or the coughing, the patient's pain will be increased. Okay. And uh, chest wall pathologies which can cause non-central chest pain include chronic cough, muscle sprain, Teats syndrome, it's also called as costochondritis, the costochondral junction will pain, and Bonhomme's disease, that is your due to Coxsackie B virus, or rib fracture, or a uh, shingles, which is caused by your varicella. Okay. It's also called as herpes zoster. Varicella virus, okay, a latent virus can manifest at an older age with shingles, which is also called as herpes also, which will be confined to a dermatome. Okay, sometimes vesicles can be there, sometimes cannot be there. So these are the causes of non-central chest pain, okay, uh, which can be classified into pleural and chest wall pathologies.
coming to the next symptom it is your dyspnea dyspnea the most important points we noted okay basically d o p e a okay these are the classical symptoms which you should ask anyway and pain you know it is the sacratus for dyspnea or any other symptom d o p e a it's a duration onset progression exacerbation leading factors associated symptoms d o p e a okay and here there is one another thing called grading of dyspnea okay anything else i am missing anything else dyspnea anything else to be asked in cardiovascular system yes there are two things which are very very important remember never forget in cardiovascular history taking these are two important things okay it is your pnd and orthopnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea okay orthopnea is dyspnea on lying down paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea after the patient sleeps after around 2 to 5 hours the patient will suddenly get up with inability difficulty in breathing after uh, half an hour the patient will feel better okay so these are the two important things which you should ask in your dyspnea history especially in a patient with cardiovascular etiology what is dyspnea Basi basically unexplained awareness of one's own breathing okay so it's a subjective experience of breathing discomfort okay right so what is the mechanism of orthopnea pnd basically the dyspnea like occur in lying supine one is the fluid redistribution into the lungs so when a patient is having heart failure there will be increase in hydrostatic pressure that will cause the edema so the fluid will get into the interstitial space okay when the patient is ambulant during the day the edema will be collecting in the legs and in the interstitial space but when the patient lies down what happens is the accumulated fluid in the interstitium will enter into the vascular compartment will go into the right side of the heart will enter the lungs and produces a breathing difficulty so this redistribution of fluid from the tissues from into the plasma and fluid distributed into the lungs okay also there will be rise in left atrial pressure and fall in uh, your partial pressure of oxygen due to sleep during sleep due to the decrease in sympathetic activity and also there can be increased venous return to the heart so these are the things factors which can lead to orthopnea okay and uh, pnd is a earliest symptom of left ventricular failure remember very very important point pnd is the earliest symptom of left ventricular failure okay and so what happens in trypnea trypopnea is left dyspnea in left lateral or right lateral position that can happen in left ventricular failure okay and what is platypnea platypnea is breathlessness on sitting upright that can happen in atrial myxoma and there is a syndrome called hepatopulmonary syndrome this platypnea is also called as platypnea orthodyxia syndrome okay orthodyxia is decrease in saturation when the patient sits up okay can happen in hepatopulmonary syndrome or the mechanism is complex i am not able i am not interested in explaining in this presentation okay just know that there is an entity called platypnea okay trypopnea is left or right lateral position platypnea is dyspnea and getting up posture okay the patient is better than lying down similarly a patient with the pulmonary embolism can feel better with lying down why because massive pulmonary embolism the patient will be in shock okay and when the patient gets up the patient will feel giddy the patient will feel as if he lost consciousness so the patient will prefer a lying down posture okay so what are the causes of dyspnea we can classify into pulmonary and your cardiac like pulmonary and others like that you can classify pulmonary causes include airways parenchyma pleural and pulmonary circulation so airway causes you know asthma copd sometimes foreign body can get accumulated causing dyspnea parenchymal causes include consolidation fibrosis malignancy pleural causes include pneumothorax and effusion okay and pulmonary circulation includes pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension a pulmonary hypertension can also cause a dyspnea okay and pulmonary hypertension can cause chest pain also because of the rv strain right ventricle will try to push the blood from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery whereas in pulmonary hypertension the pulmonary artery will resist the blood flow from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery so what happens is the rv will be you know uh, fighting to push the blood and that causes a yeah, chest pain okay and cardiac causes include left ventricle failure ischemic heart disease your mitral stenosis hocm that is your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and pericardial effusion so these are the causes of cardiac causes of dyspnea neuromuscular causes include myasthenia gravis and guillain barre syndrome chest wall causes include kyphosis and ankylosing spondylitis okay so these are the causes of dyspnea and what are the non cardio respiratory causes of your dyspnea there are some other causes which i have not mentioned here okay that can be anemia okay or acidosis okay 
that respiration is called kusmal respiration acidosis causing a respiratory pattern called kusmal respiration okay and obesity obesity per se can cause a dyspnea okay so anemia acidosis obesity sometimes psychiatric patients with the like um, um, patient with stress can manifest with the hyperventilation so they will just hyperventilate and present to the casualty okay so based on the onset how can we classify dyspnea so dyspnea occurring within minutes or hours to days weeks to months or months to years so minutes sudden onset acute onset dyspnea can be due to pneumothorax acute left ventricular failure and inhaled foreign body and pulmonary embolism okay especially massive pulmonary embolism okay and hours to days can be due to asthma COPD or pneumonia weeks to months anemia and pleural effusion and months to years can be due to tuberculosis or pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung diseases okay so where can you hear the velcro crackles that is in interstitial lung diseases okay what are the male predominant uh, the male male exclusive lung disease it is your langeron cell steatocytosis what is the female exclusive um, lung disease it is your lymphangio leiomyomatosis okay just i am talking lateral points so that just to recall whatever things which you have discussed already so dyspnea in minutes can be due to pneumothorax acute lv failure it's also called acute pulmonary edema or inhaled foreign body or pulmonary embolism especially massive pulmonary embolism so it is hours to days it can be due to asthma or copd exacerbation or pneumonia weeks to months it is anemia and pleural effusion and months to years it is can be tuberculosis or ild interstitial lung diseases based on the associated features you can think of differential diagnosis so dyspnea plus no chest pain can be due to metabolic acidosis hypolemia shock pneumothorax or pulmonary embolism okay so dyspnea with pleuritic chest pain once again these two will come here also pneumothorax and pulmonary embolism can cause pleuritic chest pain also and pneumonia and drift fracture also can cause pleuritic chest pain okay sometimes dyspnea with central chest pain can be due to massive pulmonary embolism acute pulmonary edema v sarc of dyspnea with v sarc of can be due to asthma pnd or your copd okay the classical differentiating features the differential diagnosis for a pnd will be in your nocturnal asthma okay both can cause wheeze that is this is a cardiac wheeze and that is your pulmonary wheeze okay and both can occur at night time with cough all right so having said about dyspnea having discussed about the causes of dyspnea next we are going to discuss about the classification of dyspnea how to you grade a dyspnea okay so there are two classification one is in nyha classification it is applied for cvs okay whenever you present a cvs case you should discuss this nyha classification okay class 1 there is no limitation class 2 is slight limitation of physical activity class 3 is marked limitation of physical activity symptoms at rest that's all these things you should remember rest all things is not very important remember class 1 is no limitation class 2 is slight limitation class 3 is marked limitation class 4 is symptoms of heart failure at rest okay so these are the nyha classification and i would like to highlight on the mrc classification medical research classification as well okay so number one is grade one that, that is class one two three four this is grade one two three four five grade one is not troubled by breathlessness okay except on strenuous exercise grade two is when hurrying on the level or walking up the slight uphill okay it's so hurrying on the level ground not normal walking there is no dyspnea when hurrying there will be dyspnea number three is walks slower than the most of the people on the level okay so that is because the patient's uh, exercise tolerance has come down because the severe grading of his dyspnea is severe and grade 4 stops for breath after walking about 100 yards okay and grade 5 two breaths breathlessness to leave the house okay or breathlessness when undressing okay these are the mrc that is a medical research council classification of dyspnea which we will use for a rs case presentation okay so coming to the next most important symptom it is the palpitation what is palpitation an unexplained unexpected awareness of the heart beating in the chest okay people used to describe like thumping okay thumping pounding fluttering so these are the terminologies the patients will use for describing a palpitation suddenly they will feel like the heart missed a beat okay so this heart missing a beat can occur with premature complexes atrial or ventricular premature complexes what happens is suddenly a premature complex will come the ventricle instead of pumping in the normal regular interval suddenly a premature complex will come and the next contraction will take some longer duration 
so in that time the filling will be more into the ventricle so it will force it will uh, forcefully contract and that can lead to a, a feeling of mistreat or palpitation okay that happens with a atrial or ventricular premature complex and palpitation can be proximal suddenly it occurring basically this supraventricular tachycardia psvt they will call proximal supraventricular tachycardia especially uh, supraventricular tachycardia occurring in younger age group with no previous comorbidities no coronary artery disease so that we call as PSVT and adenosine is the treatment of choice and that will occur with sudden onset and sudden offset. Whereas sinus tachycardia, when you are exertion, well, when you are going for walking or running, that time the palpitation onset is slow onset and slow offset. Slowly it increases and slowly it decreases. That is your classical feature of sinus tachycardia. Okay, and sudden onset, sudden offset is classical of your supraventricular tachycardia. And it can be regular or irregular. Okay, so irregular palpitation can occur atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation okay and what brought on by brought on by exertion yes it is possible and there are a lot of conditions can cause exertional palpitation is only in AST atrial septal defect okay and mitral stenosis can also cause like that okay sometimes caffeine or sympathomimetics can cause palpitation okay and what are the exacerbating and relieving factors once again the what are the sometimes the palpitation can get relieved by rest okay and associated features palpitation with sweating palpitation of the dyspnea okay so these are the associated features which can help in identifying the etrg okay so what are the common causes of palpitation can be due to cardiovascular causes and other causes okay so cardiovascular causes can be premature atrial or ventricular contractions that is your premature atrial complex or ventricular complex svt or ventricular arrhythmias supraventricular ventricular arrhythmias mitral valve prolapse aortic insufficiency atrial myxoma and myocarditis Okay, other causes include your hyperdynamic circulatory states. What are, what are the hyperdynamic circulatory states? Okay, as soon as you hear this word, okay, what are, as soon as you hear the word palpitation, you should remember hyperdynamic circulatory states. Okay, so anemia, thyrotoxicosis, okay, and beriberi, okay, then Paget's disease. Okay, so these are the common conditions which can cause your uh, hyperdynamic circulation. Okay. And endocrine causes include thyrotoxicosis and pheochromocytoma. Ethanol consumption can also cause palpitation. Read what is holiday heart syndrome. This is a homework for you. What is holiday heart syndrome? Okay. Yeah. Next, uh, the most important symptom is syncope. That is also called as a loss of consciousness. What happens is there is transient self-limited loss of consciousness due to acute global impairment of cerebral blood flow. This is the definition. Okay. So transient, it occurs transient okay self limited okay um, loss of consciousness okay due to acute global impairment of cerebral blood flow acute global impairment of cerebral blood flow okay duration of syncope onset how many episodes per day what is the recovery time and associated features and time of last episode okay so these are the important features to be asked what are the types of syncope one is called a neurally mediated syncope. Okay. Neurally mediated syncope is also called as vasovagal. It is very common. Okay. Like uh, patients, um, students standing in prayer for longer duration suddenly collapsing can be due to your vasovagal syncope. Okay. Then orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension can be caused by autonomic neuropathies, sometimes with diabetes as well. Okay. And third is your cardiac syncope. Okay. Cardiac syncope. Okay, what happens is uh, when, when you suddenly stand the orthostatic hypertension, I have just to uh, put some words to you. When the patient or the, anyone suddenly stands, what happens? There will be pooling of blood around 500 to 1000 ml will be pooling into the extremities, okay, in the legs. Okay, and if a patient is having already LV function failure, then the patient will not be able to compensate. Actually, what happens is when you stand, the heart rate will increase, the BP will try to improve, okay, and the response should happen. Okay, that cannot that can be impaired, especially in patients with autonomic neuropathy. All right. So what are the cardiovascular causes of syncope? Cardiovascular causes of syncope can be arrhythmias, okay, and structural heart diseases. So what are the arrhythmias? Can be due to SA node dysfunction or AV node dysfunction. There can be this we call a sinus arrest or sick sinus syndrome. So the sinus node is sick. Okay, the sick sinus syndrome, what happens is the atrium will not, the SA node will not generate impulses properly. So there can be sudden pass, long pass. So the patient can go for a syncope. Okay. And AV dysfunction, AV node dysfunction can lead to heart blocks, complete heart block or 2 is one AV block like that. And ventricular tachycardia can also cause syncope. Now, structural heart disease can be due to valvular heart disease, myocardial dysfunction, especially the triad you remember in aortic stenosis, exertional angina, dyspnea and syncope. 
myocardial ischemia especially in inferior valve myocardial infarction patients can have a heart block okay and atrial myxoma yes can lead to suddenly decreasing flow between the left atrium to left ventricle because atrial myxoma originates in the interatrial septum can obstruct the mitral orifice okay and that can lead to decrease in blood supply and can lead to synco pericardial effusion in tamponade also can cause synco because the inflow into the right side of the heart will be affected so then the left ventricular inflow will also be affected because only if the blood, blood is received by the right ventricle the blood can be put into the pulmonary circulation for purification and can be received in the left ventricle and be pumped forwards but in patients with pericardial effusion massive pericardial effusion and tamponade the inflow the supply into the rv is itself is impaired okay so there not be good amount of blood to be pumped from the rv to the lv and then to, from the lv to the systemic circulation so that can cause synco the most important differential diagnosis for a syncope will be a seizure okay so oh, how will you differentiate is there any immediate precipitating factors you have to ask usually there will be nothing whereas syncope there can be emotional stress valsalva orthostatic hypotension cardiac ectopics okay etiologies and premonitory symptoms sometimes there can be rr here there is nothing especially in diaphoresis or tunneling of vision why tunneling of vision retina is very sensitive to the hypoxia okay so when the oxygen supply is impaired that can lead to or when the blood flow is impaired that can lead to tunneling of vision okay suddenly some blackening of the vision okay and posture tonsil is usually variable and usually erect suddenly gets up from the bed okay and transition to unconsciousness is immediate it gradual over seconds and the duration of unconsciousness minutes it is seconds and duration of tonic or clonic moments it is more than 30 to 60 seconds whereas here it is never more than 15 seconds remember that involuntary movements can also occur in synco but it lasts very few seconds okay turn weight yes can be there in both also but mostly in seizure urinary incontinence can also be there in both frothing is most likely to be seen in seizure okay these are the classical differentiate points which can help you to differentiate between seizure and synco coming to the next most important history pedal edema you can ask history like instead of pedal edema you can ask ankle swelling so is there any bilateral ankle swelling okay so once again do dopea your duration onset progression exacerbating or relieving factors and associated factors and tell me what is anasarca okay what is anasarca what is anasarca so anasarca is gross generalized edema which can involve your hands your legs okay everything okay anasarca is gross generalized edema okay so ascites means accumulation of fluid excess fluid in the peritoneal cavity and hydrothorax is fluid in your pleural cavity okay so what are the mechanisms of pedal edema tell me there are three important mechanisms of pedal edema yes what are the three important mechanisms for pedal edema yes number 1 is your increased hydrostatic pressure okay number 2 is your decreased oncotic pressure okay oncotic pressure is contributed by your what albumin okay so decreased albumin can cause edema number 3 is increased capillary permeability okay so this can be the cause be drugs especially calcium channel blockers sometimes in a stage can cause a um, edema okay so increased hydrostatic pressure decreased oncotic pressure or increased capillary permeability so these are the causes of edema okay so now telling let me what are the causes of pedal edema it can be unilateral or bilateral and pitting or non pitting okay so dvt soft tissue infection trauma immobility especially hemiplegia can cause unilateral pedal edema whereas bilateral is classically seen in heart failure chronic venous insufficiency hypoproteinemia lymphatic obstruction drugs and thymine deficiency especially wet periphery there are two entities dry periphery and wet periphery okay your wet periphery will involve the heart and heart failure manifestations which causes a bilateral pedal edema okay what are the causes of non pitting edema two important causes you should remember okay one is your filariasis and another is your myxedema myxedema occurs in hypothyroidism okay so these are the two important causes for non pitting edema okay so these are the causes for non pitting edema all right yes so next important symptom which is not classical of cardiovascular history but should be asked is your cough with expectoration duration of onset quantity order these are all routinely asked okay postural or relieving factors and nocturnal cough see 
the same as orthopnea when a patient is lying down the interstitial fluid will enter into the vascular compartment and will cause dyspnea that is called your orthopnea okay dyspnea on lying down similarly when a patient is has lying down flat it can irritate the alveoli and cause cough as well okay so nocturnal cough can also occur in a patient with failure and cough on lying down can also occur with your failure patients okay so postural factors or living factors any patient is sitting will be all right but when patient lies down there will be coughing okay so these are the points in favor of a cardiovascular etiology okay and blood and coughing can occur in cardiovascular etiology as well in mitral stenosis it can due to pulmonary apoplexy pulmonary apoplexy okay dilated veins pulmonary veins can rupture and that can lead to your hemoptysis as well in cardiology okay so and uh, one another cause of cough in your cardiovascular disease is your ac inhibitor induced cough okay ac inhibitor induced cough due to bradykinin okay so what is massive hemoptysis according to your harrison it is your more than 400 ml in 24 hours more than 400 ml in 24 hours okay right so negative history these are the history issues you should ask and rule out the possible etiology pedal edema abdominal distension dyspepsia and right hypochondrial pain these are all suggesting a right heart failure symptoms okay so basically rise jvp hepatomegaly ascites and pedal edema okay thus voice change dysphagia oliguria can suggest a left sided disease voice change because especially in mitral stenosis the left atrium will be big that can compress the acromion laryngeal nerve can lead to hoarseness of voice okay that is also called as ortner syndrome o r t n e r s okay o r t n e r s ortner syndrome okay so right heart failure your pedal edema you because of the congestion abdominal distension can occur yes ascites can occur because of high history of dyspepsia because there will be venous congestion so the absorption will be impaired the food absorption will be impaired and then right hypochondrial pain because of the tender painful hepatomegaly and pulsatile liver tender pulsatile liver okay the classical differential diagnosis is your right heart failure okay very very important point and symptoms of rheumatic fever can also be asked and ruled out so ist of fever with joint pain ist of involuntary movements skin manifestation like nodules okay so uh, nodes uh, rash nodules can also be asked so okay, you are what, are what what is the rash which can occur in your rheumatic fever yes erythema marginatum right and nodules your nodules can occur in your uh, infective endocarditis okay so these are the things can be asked and can be ruled out okay and um, patient with pulmonary hypertension can also have some symptoms i just want to discuss the pulmonary hypertension symptoms okay they can present with syncope okay they can present with hemoptysis they can present with chest pain okay so these are the symptoms with the pulmonary hypertension patient can also present with okay syncope hemoptysis and chest pain okay past history so any history of similar episodes any history of rheumatic fever you how to end with rheumatic fever usually the rheumatic fever will cause severe bone pain that the patient cannot be able to walk such a severe episode in their life nobody will forget easily so if you ask many patient can give you the clue if there is any severe joint pain which you are immobile which immobilizes you then the possibility will be rheumatic fever history of hypertension diabetic ischemic heart disease tb the sexually transmitted diseases ckd thyroid disorders these are very 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 important okay so hyperthyroidism can cause atrial fibrillation hypothyroidism can cause peripodal effusion hypertension okay so these are the clues which you can get from this diabetes hypertension these are all triggers for your ischemic heart disease okay and ischemic heart disease can cause and can lead to a myocardial infarction okay sexually transmitted diseases syphilis especially can cause aortic regurgitation syphilitic ea diabetic regurgitation can occur because of the aortic root dilatation okay and history of recurrent respiratory tract infection synotic spells all these are all important questions to be asked in a congenital synotic heart disease okay so increased blood flow to the lungs will lead to a blood culture media in the lungs so lot of recurrent respiratory tract infection will be there and synotic spells is classical of it is also called as tet spells okay can occur in tof that is tetralogy of fallow okay and history of chronic fever can suggest you the etiology of either atrial myxoma or infective endocarditis committee chronic fever is there the first differential diagnosis should be an infective endocarditis in the cardiac patient and another is an atrial myxoma okay so what are the importance of family history you have to draw a pedigree chart if possible in a long case sheet and history of hypertension diabetes is important okay of those that you can inherit the inherit those disorders so that is the importance of hypertension diabetes and coronary artery disease okay especially premature coronary artery disease when do you diagnose premature coronary artery disease okay if it if she is a female 
less than 60 years okay and male less than 55 years the estrogen has a preventive role on coronary arteries okay and prevention of atherosclerosis as well okay whereas after the menopause the females are also prone to get a coronary artery disease so in females the premature coronary artery disease is defined when the age of the female is less than 60 years when she develops a coronary artery disease whereas in males it is less than 55 years okay personal history includes a diet vegetarian non vegetarian diet and smoking alcohol history as well very very important risk factors for developing a coronary artery disease and treatment history you can include whatever drugs the patient is on especially a patient with rheumatic heart disease will be on a penicillin prophylaxis once in 21 days benzathione penicillin injection they will get okay so such a treatment history can give you a clue towards the etiology okay so and one more history i would like to highlight is a sudden unexpected death sudden unexpected death okay so death in the family member so that can tell us that tell that the patient's family is having a mutation or an arrhythmia a lethal arrhythmia okay or a cardiomyopathy okay these are the causes which can cause sudden unexpected death lethal cardiomyopathy triggering an arrhythmia can cause a sudden unexpected death okay so to summarize how will you summarize summarize age sex name personal history family history then positive history whatever positive features okay you can tell then the probable system involved is cardiovascular system this is how you summarize the history so i hope you got an understanding about the various history which are important in cardiovascular system right so right from chest pain you have the socrates for chest pain okay and dopia dopea duration onset progression okay exacerbating our living factors okay there are associated features for all the symptoms okay even cough with expectoration carry some significance in your cardiovascular history and history of rheumatic fever is very very important okay and family history of cad is important hypertension diabetes is important and even ckd can cause accelerated atherosclerosis that is also important finally to come to a summary you will write all the name of course he, sometimes name is not possible in the short case history because will uh, even name it is not possible in the short case so that is different because uh, this uh, if, we, if it is a long case you will summarize after the history taking so that includes your name age sex person history family whatever positive history she is having and whatever risk factors you will highlight for example mr armudam a 60 year old gentleman uh, um, basically a chronic smoker and diabetic for the past 10 years okay and breasted is complete of chest pain on exertion for one month duration associated with dyspnea okay the probable system involved is cardiovascular system this is how your summary should be for a long case in cardiovascular system so basically important thing is to elicit a proper history you know myocardial infarction can mimic an acute abdomen okay so take a proper history that will help you to arrive at a diagnosis have always differentials okay pain above umbilicus can be due to cardiac etiology pain below umbilicus will always be a surgical etiology this is a uh, you know quote which will be which has been discussed by senior professors okay so always have a differential don't think that uh, right sided pain right sided shoulder pain cannot be of cardiac etiology because your pain in myocardial infarction or anginal pain the most common site to be localized or radiated is your right shoulder okay then both shoulders then comes the left shoulder we think that a cardiac chest pain will always lead to a pain in the left shoulder than to a right shoulder it is not so okay in the evidence based medicine st states that the most common site to be radiated for an anginal chest pain is your right shoulder then it can radiate to the both shoulders or then it can lead it to left shoulder around okay it can radiate to the back jaw okay there are a lot of uh, manifestations okay so always investigation wise the most important investigation to be done in a cardiovascular patient is an ecg electrocardiogram okay then you can go for a chest x ray and echo echocardiography which can tell you the probable diagnosis okay of course the further intervention based uh, investigation is a coronary angiogram and they have a non invasive uh, investigation which can tell you the etiology which is your cardiac mri okay so these are the various imaging imaging things which are available for confirming but before confirming you should arrive at a probable differential diagnosis for that patient okay and that we can get only with the help of a proper history taking so with this we have come to the end of this module okay thank you one and all and for any doubts or feedback you can definitely send a mail to me or a whatsapp all right so thank you so much